Amazing. Well, welcome so much, or welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to get started. Um, I guess before we start, um, I'm going to let both Joe and Dinesh share a little bit more about themselves, um, and then we'll dive into some hot topics right now. Um, after that, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A towards the end of the session. Um, so if you have any questions, keep them handy, and I'll throw it back out to the crowd later. So I guess before we start, Joe, why don't you start and share just a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. So there was a bit more of an intro there than, than I was expecting, but my name's Joe Drake. Um, I've been in the tech industry for 30 years now, um, and uh, already some, some of the organizations I've worked at have been mentioned, but I'd like to mention I started my career on the help desk, and I'm very proud of that fact, actually on the cold face, dealing with issues and customers all day long. So I'm naturally very passionate about the customer experience. Um, and all of my roles have been transformational roles as well as running roles, uh, which I really enjoy doing. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about me. Um, just to mention THG, because sometimes people are like, THG, you know, who are they? Um, so we're a global tech business. We're predominantly known for our Ingenuity e-commerce platform, but we're also a global hosting business. Um, we operate out of over 50 data centers globally. And we also have bricks and mortar. We've got hotels, gyms, spas, event space as well. So we're a very uh, diverse global tech business. Amazing, thank you. Dinesh? Yeah, so D Dinesh Mdraker, CTO at Sivo currently, but I actually started on the help desk as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, at a hosting company, so uh, I think that really does cement that customer-focused kind of view about providing um, you know, software and services and everything. So kind of what I'm passionate about is making sure customer experience is like top-notch and that they're getting value for money and, and uptime. Well, thank you both so much for being here. Really excited to dig into some of these questions with you. Um, I guess to start things out, I know most people are really interested in kind of AI and where that's going. Um, so navigating the AI frontier, Joe, I'm going to kind of pass this off to you first. Um, as artif artificial intelligence becomes an integral part of business processes, how can organizations maximize these tools for efficiency? Sure, okay, so AI is a huge, we're, we're covering some whopping great big topics <laughs> today, and we could talk about this for the whole session, but um, I think certainly most organizations, and certainly at THG, we've been starting with operational efficiency. It's generally quite a good place to start. Um, so things like um, dealing with customer, queer, uh, customer care queries, operational queries, looking for information, answering questions, and using data sets that are really trusted and known. Um, and what we're trying to make sure we do as well is that we augment humans. You know, sometimes, oh, we can, we can get rid of all the humans and it'll be really cost effective. And it doesn't always get things right, so you have to be careful about that. Um, and also, um, you need to make sure that what, one of the things we've been looking at is product descriptions, just as an example. So we're like, if we can get AI to write our product descriptions for us, that'd be great. We have a lot of people that write product descriptions manually. And also, maybe AI could write better product descriptions, which will be better for search, and it will increase revenue. Um, but you've really got to test these things thoroughly. And in some of our tests, I can't say out loud on stage how it described a T-shirt, but it was horrific, <laughs> terribly rude, and probably would have ended in a horrible marketing di disaster. But you have to check these things. So I would say start with the operational efficiencies, um, keep it basic, think about the customer experience. So we were doing something once, and when it was demoed, it was quite jarring to the customer experience. You don't want them to have, it needs to be in their stream of how, of how they, how they work through things. Um, and the other thing we've been doing as well is using existing tools we've already got, not going off and building something new straight away. That can get really, really costly quite quickly. But a number of tools that we already buy or platforms that we invest in constantly are having AI and machine learning capability um, released um, you know, every time there's a product update. And we've certainly tried to leverage some of those things when we've been writing bots and, and things like that. Um, but just taking away that uh, operational um, overhead that we've got that allows the humans then to do more of the, more of the value add stuff. So yeah, that's a bit about how we've been, how we've been approaching it. Amazing. Thank you. Dinesh, do you have anything to add there? I think it's a you know, really exciting opportunity that we have to start using these tools. I think they're, it's technology that's been around for a long time. It's like almost the 60s, 70s, going back that 
these sort of tools existed and there's been a lot of research done into it. But it's been the last, what, nine months, maybe 12 months that this has really come into the forefront of everyone's knowledge because accessibility has suddenly skyrocketed. And you can now, as a non-technical person, start making use of this really game-changing opportunity when this starts coming out and you're using it. So I think it's really, really interesting, but there is a huge security point of view from all of the data that you're giving these models. And I think that's a real challenge that, I don't know, Joe, if THG have started looking at how you safely share yeah. data yeah. with these models. Yeah, absolutely. You need to think about things like, is it safe? Is it cost effective? Or, or there's so many things that you need to think about. Which data are you feeding it? Where's it getting that data from? What if it goes rogue? What if it goes wild? Um, you know, you have to think about all of those things, all of those things as well. Um, and does it scale? And what you've built, can you maintain it? Can you support it? All of the things I have to think about as, as a CIO as well. So you need to think about, will it scale? How does it fail? That rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> Scale and fail. Um, so yeah, you need to think about all the safety aspects of it as well, but particularly Certainly. security. Yeah, yeah. No, we could probably stay on AI all day. <laughs> with I think yeah, to kind of end up on that though, I think it's something we've all got to embrace. I think everyone in the room knows that it is there and that it is out there and putting your head in the sand and thinking, oh, we can avoid this, I think is the, the wrong attitude to have. This is a new tool. This is a new technology with things like Copilot as well for helping code things. Everyone here has got to invest time into learning about these tools and how to make the most out of them, but also when not to use them and when not to trust them. I think some, some of the things we've been doing as well is around, um, particularly with e-commerce, that customer experience of helping them make decisions and find things. Um, and things like, you know, if you're buying a dress or if you want to get super shiny hair or whatever and you're looking on a website, that it can advise you in the right way. Um, but what we tend to do as well is not expose the results directly to the customer. We would use the results to search for the products and then expose the products. So if you're looking for, you know, what shoes go with this dress, um, you, you want it to then search our product information and then present that uh, to the customer too. So that's a way of making sure if there, is, if there are issues, you're not exposing it directly um, to your customers. So, thank you both. Now, another hot topic right now is navigating the cloud repatriation strategies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so as companies evaluate their cloud strategies, some are opting to repatriate certain workloads back on premises or to private infrastructure. What factors should organizations consider when deciding whether to repatriate and how can they ensure a seamless transition without compromising the benefits of the cloud? I'm gonna throw this to you, Dinesh. <laughs> Start with you first. I think it's um, a really interesting topic and I know we've been having conversations with customers a lot about how they can move off other clouds, even Sivo, and bring stuff back on-prem because the costs are starting to get really, really astronomical in these large deployments. And when you start comparing it to going out to a Dell or an HP and buying a hardware stack and running it in a data center, I think CFOs are really starting to see that there's a big disconnect from it. And there's a challenge between the engineering teams that really like what the cloud delivers, which is speed, efficiency, uh, maintainability is really, really awesome in the cloud. Yet, there's then a cost kind of conversation that's happening and driving stuff happening there. So is it, is it, it's not quite a battle, but there's a definite conversation happening between two parts of the business at the moment. Amazing, and Joe? Yeah, definitely. So there's usually three drivers towards repatriation, cost efficiency and control. And on the cost side, it's interesting what you're saying there about kind of the discussions that go on between the CFO or the CIO and, and then the CTOs and the software development teams, um, where you kind of, you, you use these cloud services in these hyperscalers because it's really easy to get access and it's fast and, and then you get your bill and it's, whoa, shit, the bill is absolutely enormous. Get it back, get it back, get it back. But the developers do love that seamless experience and the on-prem experience isn't generally seen as, as a similar type of experience. It's that, well, if you bring it all on-prem, I'm gonna have to raise a ticket for everything, which equals computer says no, which means this is gonna slow me down. Um, but the, the other problem we've had with hyperscaler consumption is that, and it happens when we're doing capacity management for peak, um, 
you'll go to those teams and say, like, how much do you need and, and you know, what capacity do you need? And quite often you'll get the response, well, how much can I have? Basically, as much as you can throw at me. But when that attitude is being applied to hyperscalers, suddenly you start to realize why your bills are going mental because it's not being consumed in a sensible way. So it's bringing it back on-prem, but giving that really great customer experience to the developers, but then all of the accounting and financial controls around it as well. And we're trying to sort of combine all of those things when we're building stuff on-prem at THG. Amazing, yeah. I think there's also a, a growing skills gap um, around running stuff on-prem. Um, we've had conversations with developer teams when we're talking about an on-prem solution and you get the comment of, oh, I can just auto-scale this when I run out of resources. And you've got another team that's going, you can't auto-scale this because it means getting more kit in and racking it up in a DC and powering it on and testing it. And there's a real interesting disconnect between people coming into the industry, I almost said younger generation, but people that are starting now where cloud is just the way that you work. Um, you know, going back to things like Heroku and the Fermion spin stuff that's happening of it's a one line deployment and you can then forget about it. Having to apply that to an on-prem deployment that potentially is more traditional with like VMware or Citrix or something like that. It's a real almost culture shift that developers have to do to learn how to consume on-prem again. And I think it's a skill that we're, we're losing from both that entry level role but also then running it and keeping it and maintaining it and having something on-prem running is actually a really difficult challenge yeah, to have. Yeah, and even how you build it, how the infrastructure teams build this stuff is completely different to the way they might have built stuff before. But it's probably worth saying as well that this, it doesn't have to be all one or the other either. You should assess it on a case-by-case -case basis. You don't have to bring everything from the cloud back you know, to on-prem. Uh, there were certain workloads where it might make sense to consume hyperscalers and that's fine. You just might want to put some more controls around that or have um, some criteria for this type of workload should run here and this should run here. And you know, some places we just haven't got the locations um, either. So you have to think about, about that too. But certainly the, the, the second part of the question there is around how do you how do you get there and do that in a seamless way? Um, and certainly the, the way we try and do it is to build these new environments, start deploying the workloads there and get the developers to include that in the workflow and then switch that to production. And uh, boom, yeah, you're done. I guess it's a challenge though of how you start that private cloud journey with new projects because not everyone is in the opportunity of getting a new project every few months. And if you're in a business that has got a well-established product that is in a cloud provider, how do you then split that up to bring a part of it back on premises? And there are loads of hidden costs on doing that transition and that validation that is not necessarily that bottom line OPEX at the end of the month cost saving. It's a whole process that you've got to put in place. Well, we've got a mix of stuff that's on-prem and not got to the cloud yet, and then stuff that's on the cloud but could come back. Because um, there's things where you were saying about like new projects where you're building something new, um, that's one thing. But if you've got something that's very legacy and old um, and it needs to be re-engineered, it needs to be re-engineered to run on a cloud, whether that's a hyperscaler cloud or, or private and on-prem. Um, so that, we found that to be a huge challenge, actually, probably more challenging than where we've been able to get like the new kids on the block, the, the fresh young talent that's come in, they're building something brand new that doesn't have hooks in some of your more legacy old school stuff. Um, not that THG is that old school, we're not actually that old, but it still happens. That stuff's really difficult uh, um, as well. So that takes a bit of consideration too. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more questions on this after as well. So we may be circling back to this at some point too. But wanted to kind of move forward because I know we have a few questions here. Um, and another hot topic that a lot of people are asking about is WebAssembly. So unlocking the potential of WebAssembly, really. Um, WebAssembly is gaining attention for its ability to enable high performance web applications across various, various programming languages. How do you see the adoption of WebAssembly shaping the future of web development? And what challenges and opportunities does it introduce for CIOs and CTOs in terms of security, compatibility, and innovation? 
So I'm going to start with you, Dinesh, um, if you want to. I think it's um, yeah, a real, I would put it on a one to watch list at the moment and something that you've got to keep an eye on at the moment. It still feels like a very young product and it, there's a lot more that it needs to do to gain a lot of traction. Um, and I've been having a good few conversations already with a lot of people around WebAssembly here today. There's a whole track about it and a whole set of conversations and talks around it. So I, I really recommend that everyone is looking at it and experimenting with it, but I still feel it's very young and there are some core features that it's missing that I know that the community around WebAssembly is talking about and getting into, into what it is. And it's gonna be interesting to see what happens when that's put there. But there's a whole, again, new cost of how you move towards this and scaling people up into doing it. And what does it offer over and above what we have today? I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how it develops over the next sort of five years. Amazing, thank you. Joe? I guess like a lot of these emerging technologies, it's about the, the use case, the story, the, the why. Um, because in theory, these things sound good and it sounds like it's kind of uh, less overhead and it's more streamlined. But then I guess you're putting a lot of the work like back more at the client end of things. Um, we've done that before and then we've brought it kind of back into, now let's do all of that back here in the data centers. But I think, um, you know, it fits in with some of the other things that we're talking about. I know we're going to talk a bit about sort of 5G and that sort of thing, but um, I, th I think it's, it needs balance. It needs a balanced approach. Um, I would still ask the questions about whatever it is that you do. Does it scale? Will it fail? And things like error handling can be difficult because of the way the code presents itself back. It's not necessarily easy for anybody to troubleshoot or manage an issue with it. Um, so that could get a bit complex and cause issues from, from an operational um, point of view. Um, for us at THC, it's all very much sort of wrapped up in our serverless um, approach to things. And then you start consuming some of these sort of cloud function services like Lambda or um, Cloudflare workers or, or Fastly or whatever. But again, then they can start to spiral out of control completely those costs as well. And like everything we talk about today, it's about balance and choosing the right, the right use cases. Absolutely, and I know um, those cost savings keep coming up time and time again, especially with a lot of these emerging technologies and kind of where things are going. I think it's really interesting you say about this yo-yo between moving stuff from server side to client side, back to server side, yeah. back to client side, and it feels like we just keep moving <laughs> stuff. Back and back. forth, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I know we have quite a few WebAssembly talks happening throughout the conference, so if you have a chance, um, this is a subtle plug to go check out some of those. Um, another really hot topic is edge computing um, and maybe the advantages of edge computing, um, especially with 5G coming to the forefront. Um, so with edge computing um, gaining so much, uh, so much traction for its ability to process data closer to the source, how can companies leverage this technology to improve real-time decision-making and drive innovation? I'm gonna pass this over to you, Joe. Yeah, sure, so 5G, it means we can start to push a lot more out to the edge. It also means clients have got, or customers have got more power in their, their device in their hand, they've got more, more bandwidth going to them, so you can make richer experiences. Um, it kind of goes back to the WebAssembly thing as well, like how much are you pushing out there? Because, you know, the closer you get stuff to the, to the customer, the better. Um, but how much? And I think it's about those use cases, and it's not a you have to eat the whole elephant type situation. You can split, split these things up and have, you know, the low latency stuff happening there on the edge. Um, we've been looking at a concept like uh, regional soup centers that do some more of the heavy lifting stuff, and then you go back to the core DC for the really heavy lifting stuff. But then that starts to change the entire approach to your data center and connectivity architecture as well. Um, and then you start to think, well, do I need these great big firewalls and these big, you know, huge devices that cost all this money in my data centers? And how do I move from that to not, because the data center, the core data centers are taking on a different, a different role now. Um, and then you have to think, well, we change all of that, and then we go, oh, are we going to start moving stuff back from there, back here, and suddenly you're, you're back at the beginning again. Um, 
So it all needs thought, the things need breaking down, you need to figure where stuff's going to run best, but whatever you decide, it's likely to impact the way that you architect your data centers. Um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a lot, quite a lot to think about. Absolutely. Like you said, a lot of similar themes there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some yeah. of these other um, questions that we've had. Dinesh, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I think Edge is really, really interesting on that pushback towards processing to a client side, because there are different ways that you think about Edge. Is it, as you say, an Edge, edge data center? Or do you now consider Edge a, um, a almost like a car? Does that become an Edge location where you're now deploying stuff to? Um, I know like um, Kubernetes is obviously a big topic today, but do you start running Kubernetes now on cars? Or there was a project where they ran it on fighter jets. Um, <laughs> and you know, it seems like bizarre about doing that, but you've got a whole set of like, why are you doing this? And what does an edge mean? And should you be doing it? Because just because you can doesn't mean you should. I even saw a project about Kubernetes running on some CubeSats up in space. Um, and I don't know why, other than it was very, very cool, <laughs> very, very, very exciting. Yeah. But I don't, how much more edge do you get than outer space? That is pretty, pretty edge, pretty edgy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where is the edge? Um, figuring that, yeah. that bit out as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely have to circle back with some additional questions there. Um, we have a handful more. Um, maybe. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. Um, so really looking to the future and safeguarding the future. Um, Dinesh, I know you have uh, quite a bit of background in cybersecurity, um, but as cybersecurity threats grow more sophisticated, how can companies proactively adapt their cybersecurity strategies and leverage technologies like zero trust architecture to ensure data protection in an increasingly digital landscape? I'm gonna let you start, um, especially with your background. Would love to kind of hear a little bit of um, not only your answer, but some of your background and how um, that may relate to now. I think um, there's been a shift in thoughts around security about um, not if people get into infrastructure, it's when they do and you're assuming that you've already broken into and what people have access to. Um, I think that's been a conversation shift that at least in defense we were starting to, to have. And there was this old traditional model of you've got a perimeter firewall that you assume is a big, big wall, no one will ever get in. And then if that does happen, it's free game and everything's unencrypted, everything's free to access and, and off you go. Whereas I think now like these ideas of zero trust are really becoming to the forefront and you're assuming it, you, you've already been compromised should be the way that you're now looking at deploying applications and securing your data. And then once you've got that mindset is like right in, encryption now goes all the way down to can you do, uh, like database rows and each database row now becomes encrypted. So when someone gets access to a database, it becomes even harder for them to extract data and, and actually make use of it. And I know it's, a, it's an ever evolving threat around it and it's an ever evolving challenge and kind of going back to the machine learning stuff as well. And there are some really interesting topics at the moment about people putting data into these machine learning models to write purposefully insecure code. And that if you've got people that are you know, developers that are generally new, junior, that are trusting the code coming out of these tools implicitly, because they don't have the experience and they don't know what to look for in insecure code, that just gets pushed out into production. Say that we're in a world where it gets tagged, this was written by a machine, suddenly your merge request pipeline or your merge reviews go, oh, it was written by a machine, I don't need to review that quite as closely. And now suddenly you've got malicious code into a model, into production, and no one has really noticed it go through that flow. And and it's just going to be harder and harder for us as an industry to moderate cybersecurity. And yeah, I don't know if you're seeing that sort of thing. Yeah, I think, I think you're right about assume, assume that they've got in and you've got to reduce that blast radius once they're in. Um, it's like kind of having an enormous great big armored front door, but you've, you've got your side doors wide open. And once they're in, your best china's <laughs> everywhere and they're going to smash the joint up so you know you want to make sure your best china is put away and that everything's protected and that they can't destroy anything mm -hmm. once they're in um and i think you're right about that trusting thing you, you know your software's got to be secure but actually 
do we need to think a lot more about the hardware as well and actually inbuilt security into things like the CPUs um, as well? Can we protect from, from, from the hardware as well as the software and as well as your, um, your, your networking and, and your connectivity? But, but something I see in this space is in speaking to other CIOs, CTOs or IT directors or whatever, security is the one area where their budgets are going through the roof. Everything else is kind of going down, but the budget for cyber or infosec or whatever you, you want to call it is going up and up and up because there's a much higher awareness at a board level of this type of thing. There's more stuff in the press. There's more horror stories. Um, but then that leads to, I mean, the vendors know that. The vendors know that people have got these big budgets to burn through. They're throwing products at them. They've got every product you can shake a stick at under the sun. People don't understand how things work together, what you should use for what. You just become overwhelmed and blinded. You know, you can't see the wood for the trees with, with all of these tools and, and data as well. So it can become really crowded with regards to the tools that you use to manage this area. And even then, it's on the circumference. It's not once they've got in, let's reduce the, the blast radius. You need to do all of that. Yeah. I think there's so much noise that these tools throw out because, uh, and I think it's the, potentially the right way of doing it, of you want to know everything and you want to log everything and you want to alert on all of the, on everything that's going on because you don't know necessarily which is going to be the, the alarm that says that someone's got keys to the kingdom. But we've been talking about alert fatigue for so long in mm. cybersecurity, but it's just getting, as you say, worse and worse and worse as people are bringing more and more tools into a business. Suddenly you've gone from one tool to five tools to 10 tools, all throwing out alerts, some that corroborate, say the same thing. I don't know what that word is. Correlate. <laughs> correlate, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some alerts do correlate, some don't, and you now need to work out what do I actually look at, what do I, what do I prioritize, or do I put my head in my sand and just go, there's a big firewall on the edge, we're probably fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the majority of people that need to work with these tools are not in the security team. You know, they're developers or they're in infrastructure or they're in operations and you don't want to be confused. You want to know what, what's happened, what do I need to do? It's that simple, but you can get blinded uh, with all this information. So yeah, getting a bit crowded. I guess as well that it's interesting how security is integrated into an organization because as you start, start and as you grow, you'll get the one person in that's now gonna be responsible for your compliance. And then they're normally the ones that bring in a tool and then they're getting technical alerts coming through that they have to give to now the, the operational team. And they go, oh, I, I've got this whole other list of things that I need to be doing. I'll put this alert down to the bottom of the list and whether or not they pick it up. And it's a very interesting culture thing about how you integrate security into a business and integrate those teams into it. So it's not just a technical thing that you've got to bring in. It has to be a culture thing. It has Definitely. to be spread across the organization. Absolutely, rather. yeah. I mean, at THG, security is everybody's responsibility. It's our top priority. Um, you know, if everything's secure and we're all safe, great. Are we operational? Are we up and running? Great. Then we go off and we build, we build new stuff. So, yeah, it's a really, it has to be a really big part of your culture. Um, super important. Thank you both. Um, I guess our next question is really around the sustainable tech transformation. I know it's been brought up a few times. Um, Mark mentioned it earlier today, uh, during, right before the keynotes. But with the growing emphasis on sustainability, how can technology leaders drive eco-friendly initiatives through innovations like green data centers, energy efficient coding best practices, and other technology designed to reduce electronic waste? Joe, I'm gonna let you start with this one. This is another tiny little topic <laughs> we're gonna cover. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it's huge, isn't it? And I think as well, it's been done to death a, a lot as well. And I think for me, the focus needs to be on the eco-coding as well because I think there's a lot of people are thinking it's fine because this is being dealt with either by infrastructure teams or data center teams or the procurement team or the finance team or the sustainability team over there that everybody else is, is kind of doing their bit and they are. You know, there's loads going on with green data centers and carbon zero and supplier chain and circularity and all of it. it's all being done. Um, 
But the, the one area I don't really see being tackled, I haven't anyway, is on that eco-coding. So having good, streamlined, efficient code that consumes things in a sensible way, I think is absolutely critical to, to sustainability. So when I went back earlier and said, if you ask, what do you need to run? How much do you want? How much do you need? Or when they're using a hyperscaler, they're just eating it up and consuming it all up. Um, and they say, well, how much can I have? Give me as much as I can get. Well, that's all in a rack somewhere. It's consuming power and CPU and cooling. Um, so I think if we can start to ensure that our applications are built in a sustainable way and eco-coding becomes a real thing and that we're consuming that infrastructure in a sensible way, I think that's going to make a really, really big difference alongside all of the other great initiatives that we could talk about all day, but they're, they're largely being covered. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's, it's a great point about eco-coding. I think, you know, we're seeing this sort of shift left on things like, um, you know, security, a shift left and coming the responsibility of the developers. Um, we've had like CICD and almost like uptime continually shift left down to developers. And I think sustainability and efficiency of coding is going to be the next thing that we're starting to push down. But I don't feel as an industry yet we're tooled up to give developers that information to make these sustainable decisions because, you know, it's not easy to get a developer to see that their, their lines of code that they're writing, if it's just say, for an example, a loop, it either runs 100,000 times or 10,000 times. And that has an impact not only on costs, but then the heat generated by the CPUs and the power and the cooling to, to support that. Mm. But I don't know of any tools that probably are out there that give that information back all the way to developers. And I think it's also interesting that how do you get developers to understand the different scales at production that you're running at? Because I don't know, you shouldn't have any developers that are developing against production at all. And the data set sizes are just vastly different. So while you might write something on your local machine that's got 100 lines in a database or 100 entries in a database, it runs fine, it runs quick. You can't actually compare how that's going to run when you go out to production that's now running across 20 mm. sites, yeah. across millions of lines of databases and being queried a lot. I don't know how we give that information back to developers through merge reviews or whatever to, to give them the ability to, to fix it. Yeah, that is a really good point. Getting that data back to the developers and then helping them understand what that means and then what they can do uh, to be eco uh, in their coding. Absolutely, and like you said earlier, it's um, everybody's responsibility, so. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. So I think, oop, I don't know if my thing wants to work. I, I think believe... you need some new batteries. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe that's all of our questions right now. Um, so I'd love to really throw it out to the audience um, and see if anybody has any additional questions on the topics that we may have already covered, or if there's any topics um, that maybe we didn't bring up that you'd like to know more about. I need that front row to warm up, just in case I <laughs> pick on any of them as well. So, mic is up. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Okay, so I did see a couple of hands. I will come to you. I've got one here first. Before I walk the floor, can I just straw poll the room? Because I loved how you both started on the help desk. Who else in the room started on the help desk? One or two. Okay, my kind of people. <laughs> we can get your name and then your question. Uh, Sal Kimmick, um, yeah, I wanted to jump back to this whole, like, like the security thing. The cloud engineers are my hardest audience to get them to understand that, like, you can do fitness functions for everything else, right? You're literally engineers that build things that are meant to be fluid. Culturally, that is totally different from zero days and cybersecurity concerns modern day. What can we do to get this kind of engineer to understand? It has to be incentivized in some way. So um, you know, the keynote today was, was really great about giving these OKRs and giving metrics. So as leaders, we have to create a metric now on, you know, is it something really, really basic, like the number of alerts that Tool X is generating over the next three months, we want to reduce it. And you're going to continue to iterate on that because you're going to get these cloud engineers looking at the tools. They're going to have to understand what the alerts are to then 
put something in place to reduce the number of alerts, and it's almost by osmosis and culture that we start getting people to look at that and sort of metricing them on it, which is probably not how they want to work. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a cultural thing, isn't it? And we all know culture is way more difficult to change than, than the technical side of the job. And things like measures and OKRs and things like that just make them shrivel up inside and want to die because they don't want to live in a world where, where they need to worry about that sort of thing. So I think it is about incentivizing people, making it cool, making them know they need to worry about it because I think a lot of engineers assume it's not their job to worry about that. It's somebody else's job to make sure that um, things are built in a, in a secure way, in a repeatable way. So I think it's a mix, mix of education, incentivization, make, trying to make it cool somehow, make it um, recognized. Um, you know, how many people do you see running around going, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm cool because I'm the most, I, I built the most secure application. Well, why shouldn't that be a cool thing that, that is recognized and put up in lights? But it is cultural and it, it is difficult and it's a real, real situation that we have to deal with. I think, yeah. One thing that's just come to mind and is a really, really evil, harsh way of doing it is just put a security alert on call and that you get paged in the middle of the night whenever a security alert goes off. You'll find that these cloud engineers fix it really quickly because we all love sleep. <laughs> <laughs> mm, going for the sleep, that is a bit evil. <laughs> awesome. Do we still have Nigel in the audience? Yeah, here. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, hi, guys. Um, Daniel. Uh, so... I just want to circle back to that point about sustainability uh, when writing code for the cloud. The problem I see there is that the cloud is kind of diametrically opposed to the concept of visibility of the hardware that you're running your code on. Cloud provider X is not going to particularly care if your algorithm scales of O and N or O of N squared in terms of a complexity requirement because why should they? They're just there to provide hardware and you run your stuff on it. I don't really know of many cloud providers that are gonna give you visibility on the impact you're having until, like I say, at the end of the month, oh, you've gone and spent 10K on your, um, on your hyperscaler because, oh yeah, your algorithm just keeps on adding and adding uh, nodes and keeps on running up at max CPU uh, because your code is inefficient. So what financial incentive, because that's really the only incentive that's going to actually impact this, can cloud providers find to ensure that they are going to run like efficient code? Because yeah, mm. they're only going to they're only going to care if it's in their financial interest. Let's be perfectly honest here. I yeah, I, well, it's, I think though that the tools do exist. Um, I know that um, GKE give you metrics on carbon usage of pods that are running, and that gets filtered all the way back. They do it down to data centers as well. So um, I think uh, last time I looked, they gave you differing carbon different times of day that your code is running. So that visibility is there. We as developers and cloud engineers have tools that can move workload across data centers to locations that are more carbon sensitive, yet we don't have those tools necessarily push all the way down to developers, to cloud engineers to make use of that. So the, the tools are out there and from a, a cloud point of view, there is a huge incentive for us to be getting more efficient, more sustainable practices out to our customers because energy is limited in every way, shape, and form. And we can't just keep putting more and more generators into the world at the moment. So there are these limits that we've got to do, and we, we do need to work on pushing that down to, to end users. I think I'm also sitting here wondering, is that something the cloud providers need to do? And I'm casting my mind back to when in my Yahoo days and working with the SRE team there, we used to build tools that would um, 
score your application for you on a, on a number of criteria. So you knew if you met this criteria, your uh, application would be scored an A, which means it meets all this criteria, t criteria brilliantly, um, right down to an E. And an E would mean, actually, you need to improve this, you need to improve that. And I'm almost imagining that you could have an eco score as part of that, which scores your application from, it, from some eco criteria that say if your application's built in this certain way or it consumes infrastructure in this. So I, I, don't, I can't think what the criteria might be off the top of my head, but maybe we need to, to build better tools that can actually score and, and then give that feedback to developers so it can educate them and guide them as well, give them guardrails to follow, but um, I need a bit more thought, but um, I'm just thinking that's how we would sort of get criteria into the application developers and help them from way back from when we were doing SRE stuff in early days at Yahoo, so. I think um, we as users of cloud, now this is not as my, my CVO CTO hat, but, but as users of these services, we can vote with our feet. And if there is a provider that is doing a lot in this space, um, you know, like Google, for example, um, you know, like Sivo with the, the deep green partnerships that we're doing, if the, we as end users start making these decisions, the industry will follow and will make all of the changes that need to be done and it will accelerate it. So it's something that we can do. There is a CNCF sustainability panel as well about getting these sorts of information out of Kubernetes clusters down to, to users. Um, I know two years ago, Intel were, were talking at KubeCon about how they're changing information around p-states to so power states on the CPUs so that you could say in this block of code, I don't need to be running a high power CPU and you can drop down to a lower level. So th the industry is doing work around this, but I think it's still in that infancy. And over the next five years, more and more tools have to come out to give developers information to make these decisions. Amazing. Any more? I've got loads if you don't. Oh, here we go. Hi, um, I'm Paul. Um, just a quick question. You two both very busy C-suite execs. How do you, you know, you've talked eloquently about a whole range of topics today. So how do you stay ahead of the things that are going to be of interest to your businesses long term? Where do you go to go and find out information? And, and maybe as a tip to, to all of us overworked C-suite folk here. How do you distill that down into the things that are relevant and important going forward? Well, I, I'm sure you're the same. <laughs> Reading a lot, talking to a lot of people, lots of events. I mean, you could go to an event every morning, lunchtime, afternoon, dinner and evening if, if you wanted to. And I think it's about, for, for me, uh, I'm, I'm about understanding the story, the impact, the opportunity or the problem that you're trying to solve rather than talking about technology or you know, new innovative ideas in isolation. I wanna know what, what the outcomes were. And I think it's, you know, there are several networks I work really, really closely with, um, lots of mentors, coaches inside of THG, outside of THG, talking to my team every day about things that, that they attend to. So, um, it is a big part of the job, trying to keep up with it all, but um, I'm not so much for worrying about what the technology is itself. It's about the outcome that, that can be, um, or, or hearing a, a use case. You know, I love, when, when these type of events are on, I like the customer, when the customers get up on stage and they talk about what they have achieved using that, that vendor's technology, and that can really start to get the creative juices flowing or thinking about how can I apply that into my business. Um, I think we're quite lucky at THG because we're such a diverse business. We've got many, many tentacles involved. We've got different technologies we might maybe use in a warehouse that you might go, I, actually, that could solve a problem I've got over here or that could create a different opportunity over there. So we're quite lucky that within our organization, we've got lots and lots of different types of businesses and, and use cases. Um, so yeah, how about? How about you? Um, I, it's, a really, it's really tough um, to, to do that and to try and keep on top of it. I, I think personally, I've almost outsourced it to my team. Um, so we've got a, a Slack channel just that's called Random, and it normally gets articles posted by the team members in it, and that's my sort of go-to for, for what's cool, what should I be looking out for. 
as a start, um, because lucky enough to have a load of really, really intelligent engineers working for us at Sivo that uh, love the tech and love wanting to play with new toys. So there's a partial bit that I've got to do of stopping them playing with new toys, but it's a really interesting way of me finding out about new stuff that I then need to go and research and then come to, as you say, conferences like this and having conversations with people that are at venues like this is incredible. And there are so many knowledgeable people here today and at events like this that just ask. And uh, all tech events, everyone is really, really friendly. And everyone I always say is like, oh, you're in your safe place because you can talk tech to tech people really, really easily. And everyone just loves geeking out about stuff at events like this. So it's kind of where I go to. <laughs> Any more? Hi there, my name's James. Uh, just a quick one on generative AI. Um, we talk a lot about how one of the initial use cases is to push it operationally, let people empower themselves and Im improve the way they work. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, the information security uh, perspective of that with regards to sharing accidentally or otherwise client data to try and drive your answers? So you might want to share a perspective of your client and get some good feedback back. Of course, that's them feeding large language models going across potentially globally and, and different sort of um, areas of the world where you're then breaching GDPR. Uh, what are your thoughts with regards to how you would um, empower your teams to use it, but then not um, worry, should I say, about the potential consequences? <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough, but it, really with this idea of pushing security down to every end user, we just need to educate people that putting data into a large language model like ChatGPT is the same as posting it on a snippet on GitHub. And would you put this information on a snippet publicly on GitHub? No, you shouldn't put it in ChatGPT. And all of these tools that are you know, publicly available, like ChatGPT is free. It's not really free. They're getting your information out of it. And it's an education piece because it's not just language models. This is a threat that everyone applies to everything that they do every day. Yeah, it really, really worries me, client, talking about client data and using it. And it's interesting because you'll get clients ask about, oh, you've got some really interesting other clients, and I'd, I'd really like to know a bit about what's hot and what's not and what's selling where and all that, but, I'd, but not my, and not my data. <laughs> you know, I don't want to keep mine here, but I want to see all of theirs. And of course, they all, they all feel the same. We worry about the security elements of it and where, where it could end up. It, it, I don't know the answer. It makes me really nervous when you start talking about client information. Um, how can you tap into that safely? Because it could be hugely valuable. Um, but the impact of if something goes wrong in that area is, is scary and big. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer apart from it's a bit, bit scary. I think um, it's worth looking at the medical industry um, and medical research in particular, because this is a problem that they have been looking at for a long time. Um, and there's this term called federated learning, which is the idea of machine learning across aggregated data. So you'll have Research Institute one that will have a data set that they will give to a developer of an algorithm, but they define the queries that can be run across the data set. So you will say, I want to know the average height of anyone between the ages of 40 and 50 is a query that you can run, but you can't do a select where ID equals one. Mm. So you can do aggregated queries around that, and there is a whole area around this about doing research. And I think that's going to be something that with these large language models, we're going to have to learn from and start applying to models that we're using now in e-commerce how do we get those aggregated queries, federated learning run in that way? But the data needs to be anonymized, doesn't it? So you, you might know how many people are aged over 50 or whatever, but not necessarily those that are called Dave that are aged over 50. So I think, but how do you get that education and that care into the people that are feeding this data into models? Uh, so yeah, it needs, it needs some, some thought. I think it's, uh, there's a, uh... S in and S out is uh, kind of what they're using in a machine learning term. So this filtering of data, and I guess across all of your brands as well, they must have different ways of storing the data. 
to try and then aggregate that into something that can be used as a general research or a general language mm. model will be really, really difficult. So yeah, it's, it's a huge area of, of like research at the moment and something we can do a lot about. Anybody else? So I'm going to be super cheeky, if you don't mind. <laughs> I wrote loads of questions while you were talking. I'm just going to pick one, because I know people get hungry. So I'm a skeptic, OK, when it comes to repatriation, so bringing applications and data back into the data center. What I heard when I was sat there this morning, I don't think it helped me. So I heard two things, right? So there's a rising generation of people coming into the industry who all they know is the cloud, OK? You repatriate that onto a data center, and they don't understand that, guess what? There's actually a real physical server or multiple that goes behind all of this scaling, like, let me show you. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. But you also talked about refactoring applications to get them onto the cloud. Now, the data center's not the cloud, so we're going to have this rising generation of people that all they know is the cloud. We've already done a bunch of work to refactor to get onto the cloud. I'm assuming we have to refactor, at least in some ways, to get off the cloud. Is it worth it? Like, is, is it going to be a real thing? Or are we going to get like WebAssembly and other technologies that are just more efficient and allow us to stay on the cloud at lower costs? Does that make sense? I, I think it's a bit of all of that that you just said. It really depends on on the workload as well. So, and also the on-prem experience for the developers, that needs way more thought than it's ever had previously, historically. So how do you provide that hyperscaler experience for the developers on-prem is a really big area that we're, we're certainly working on at THG. Um, because do, do they need to know it's in a rack and it's here and it's there and you can go and touch it and kick it if you want to. Um, they, they won't understand that, but they, they, they understand cloud. So, and, and then there's some of those old legacy apps that are still on-prem that never made it to cloud yet. And if you're providing a hyperscaler experience on-prem, you need to say to those, this isn't about taking your, your legacy app, making it run on-prem here. They almost need to make it so it would run on the cloud if it's going to run on an on-prem hyperscaler ex developer experience type of platform. So I think, I think there are elements of everything you said that, that need to be thought about. It's, it's hard. I think it's the only thing to really say about it, that there are competing things. Is it, is it cost of what is the driver from the business of bringing it back on-prem? Because we're looking at Edge, for example, is a potential way of bringing it on-prem. Um, you know, I'm sure that you've got warehouses that need compute locally mm. to process things really, really quickly um, with machine learning and, and um, computer vision. There are opportunities to be doing a lot in factories about automating things with computer vision. And that feedback cycle of going to a cloud data center to get a machine learning outcome to then drive a factory starts to become really, really long. So it's not just cost, but potentially Edge is also driving that decision to move on-prem and having that short feedback time. So maybe is, is probably the answer, but it, it really depends on the use case. And but you're right, Joe, yeah, that case case. you need to, internally, if you're doing an on-prem cloud, it needs to feel like a cloud to developers because no one knows any other way, and it's just going to get more and more like that. And all the things we talked about, repatriation, WebAssembly, the edge, they all overlap. And they need to complement each other, but it could get, could get a bit complicated. Thank you. So we are at about the bottom of the session. One last quick one. Everybody's hungry. <laughs> well, I mean, if you need to um, educate people on hardware, I mean, going back to the sustain sustainability thing, donate it. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like um, certainly from like the experience, my, my experience, and uh, people I've spoken to who like do run some of their own setups and their own like minified versions, um, that education process using like donated hardware um, to set up a lot of the stuff in miniature is a really helpful process. And one of the things that saddens me about the state of 
tech is the sheer mountain of waste it creates. So many servers, hard drives, pieces of computer hardware just basically goes into a shredder, which yeah. is pretty awful considering how much effort and energy and resources goes into it. And like, I think the energy requirements of like burning out a server is like minuscule compared to just making a new one. So just even just keeping the old hardware running, even in small capacity, like give it to a school or something, is, is still far more economically sound in a lot of ways than just making brand new stock. So is donation to um, like a thing that you guys would want to do to NGOs or uh, charities or um, any sort of organizations? Is that something on the cards for you guys? Do you mean like, so I didn't hear every word. Do you mean donating hardware? Yeah, take your yeah. old server racks, your old drives, the things that you're not going to be using anymore because they're a bit old and the, long in the tooth. It's Absolutely. gone two years old and it's like, oh no. We are, we are very good at THG of, of, of really sweating the hardware and getting the most out of it and rebuilding things using lots of different components, donating um, to charity. We do a lot of stuff with local communities um, around donating hardware, providing support for all of that and that type of thing. Um, we do, you know, we do have to shred some of it, but we absolutely minimize uh, the amount that we do there. But I think as well, just connecting everybody in technology with the hardware element of it has got less and less over my time in the industry, because when, when I think back to my early days where if I needed a powerful machine, I had to buy the components and build it myself and hook myself up to my anti-static mat and, and build it. Um, and I think there's a real disconnect between the software and, and the hardware that I think we've lost over time. I think there's probably a lot of education and exposure that can be given across people working in tech to the hardware and what it does to the planet as well. Even like the old monitors and the big piles of <laughs> yeah. equipment that we've got out there that can't be recycled, it's, it's horrific. Um, but I think education will help and exposure to that side of things will, will help the industry as a whole. Um, and it goes back to the comment I made about the eco-coding. I think everybody assumes that's somebody else's job or even facilities, it's a facilities job to get rid of old tech kit, just like you get rid of a, an old chair or, or yeah. a desk or whatever. So I, I think there's a gap. There's definitely a gap there. Yeah, like, quick show of hands, guys. Like, who here home labs? Like, yeah, yeah, there we go. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say anything, Dinesh? I, I think you've, you've covered it really well. I think, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that we, would, that we all do and that donating back to, to schools and everything. I mean, I know that a lot of the equipment we've had is in a staff's home lab somewhere. Um, you know, we're really happy doing that. And Andy, Andy's smiling. I don't know if you've got any at home as well, but you know, that's really good. But it's, it's again, it's making sure that the components that you do use, like hard drives are really hard to give away, really, really hard, because even if you, you, you erase them and you erase them, you still need to shred them really. And that, that's difficult, but components and stuff definitely go to a new home. Okay, great job. Thank you guys. Can we get a round of applause? Thank you.